Good morning. My name is Vlad, this is Julian, and hey. we're here to talk to you about the visual effects graph with all the jet-lagged enthusiasm we can muster. This presentation will have a bit of everything. We will start with some eye candy. We will go into an overview of what the system is, how it works. Julian will give a more deep technical overview of how it works behind the curtains. And then we're going to have a live demo within the editor. Okay, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's happening next. But first, we're going to show you a little reel we put together of some of the effects that we created during development. So some of this is programmer art, but here we go. So we're going to start by answering this question, what is the visual effect graph? So it's a brand new tool we're bringing to Unity to create next generation visual effects in real time. It is fully visual and has a hybrid stack not base paradigm. So basically you stack blocks into context of the execution uh, to define some behaviors and then you can drive blocks parameters with nodes. It is fully programmable and flexible, and we provide you with a standard library of nodes that can be extended. So when you work on a visual effect graph, you actually work on an asset where you can then expose parameters from this asset and instantiate it using VFX components within the scene. You can then override all those parameters directly within the components. We're using GPU for the simulation, so you need to have compute-capable device to run the visual effect graph. So the key points. We wanted an artist-friendly tool, so everything is visual. There's no coding involved. You don't have to write a single line of C-sharp if you don't want to. Plus, as we are you're defining your behaviors within an asset. Everything is compiled within the asset. All the behaviors is now data. It's no, 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 uh, no runtime uh, needed anymore, no modules or stuff like that in the C++ runtime of Unity. So you can uh, define your, your features uh, quite easily and, uh, and add uh, whatever you want. We also have the scalability of effects. So you can, you can author from a very small effect, like sparks or puffs of smoke, to a very crazy effect with millions of particles uh, with complex behaviors. Authoring VFX uh, using nodal interface has been popular in, um, in film industry for years and is now becoming a trend in the gaming industry. Finally, we provide an implementation for the HD render pipeline. So we implemented most of the features. So we got lit and lit distortion, transmission, mostly everything. And if you want to plug the visual effect graph into your custom SRP, it's possible as well using a few hooks. So now we're gonna continue with a small comparison between GPU and CPU particles. So the current particle system in Unity is using the CPU for the simulation. So all the data are simulated on CPU and then transferred to the GPU for rendering. For the visual effect graph, we are doing everything on the GPU. So it allows to, uh, to have a lot more particles per system due to the parallel nature of GPU. In the same way, the behavior can be much more complex for the same processing times. However, if you want to rely on the underlying physics systems, it resides in the CPU accessible memory. So for GPU particles, you need to rely 
on other scene representations, like primitives or sign distance fields. You can also use the depth buffer to get your particle to collide with it. If you want your particles to interact with uh, gameplay, you'd better have your simulation on CPU because reading back data from GPU to CPU is a very costly operation. And finally, on GPU, you have access to all the data that are in the video memory, like frame buffer, so you can achieve cool screen space effect that you cannot do with CPU particles. So both GPU and CPU have their pros and cons. And they need to cohabit to, uh, together, and, uh, and uh, you, you, you have to choose based on what you want to do, if you want to do on CPU or on GPU. So now I let Vlad talk about the concept of the tool. Thank you. So we have envisioned sort of three layers of accessing and uh, using the visual effects graph. Bottom layer is basically people who have no domain knowledge within effects. So these are um, your uh, artists, level designers, or even programmers that really interact with things that have been exposed, whether things you can call via the API and code, whether you're modifying things that have been exposed in the inspector. So at this stage, you're really just tweaking exposed values on an already created effect. The core part is actually authoring these effects. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have used Shader Graph? Okay, so a lot of you are familiar with it already. Um, as Julian mentioned, we have this node-based uh, interface where you are connecting different nodes. So this part of the asset authoring is you actually being within the visual effects graph window and actually creating your own simulation, plugging nodes together. Um, and this is also the place where you can expose things for somebody else to tweak. And then at the very top of the pyramid, um, this is for the more technically inclined users, we have offered the ability for you to customize and extend the visual effects graph. So you don't have to wait on us to actually implement a custom solution that your studio might need. You can create your own notes, blocks, outputs, and behaviors. To visualize this a little bit further, the first level, as we mentioned, is not much unlike actually exposing things to the inspector, modifying the material, that kind of stuff. So everybody has access to that that can do it. The middle level, as we said, is actually working with the notes. And the demo we'll show a little bit later will kind of demonstrate how that looks. And the last level is code. So let's talk a bit about the flow of the data. So this is a very quick overview to get you an idea of how the data is structured within the visual effect graph. We have these contextual nodes, and they're sort of the vessels that carry all the data within them. And then they contain blocks, and blocks are the places where you set your attributes, you know, like in initialize you might set the start size, the color, that kind of things. And the flow of this is from top to bottom. So as you initialize particles in the very top of the graph, as the data traverses down, it can evolve. You can grab it, modify it, and um, basically use it for your simulation. And then the left to right, we can plug different nodes. This is very similar to Shader Graph for those who have used it. And this um, allows you to basically combine different behaviors to control and um, affect the simulation of these blocks. So as a higher end overview, there's a lot more depth that can go into it, but the first level is the spawning contextual node is basically determining how many particles are you spawning. It also determines how you're spawning them, are you doing constant spawn rate, bursts, etc. In initialize, you're setting the initial values of these particles. Um, if you are familiar with the particle system within Unity, it is akin to the main module of the particle system. And uh, if you're programming, it's not much unlike the start method in C-sharp. So it's called once for the system. Then we have update. And this is a great place to put the logic that determines how your particles are going to change over time. And again, it is akin to the update method within C-sharp. And then we have the actual output. So the first three that we discussed here are really controlling the, uh, the count and the simulation of the particles. But at the end of the day, we have to render them on screen. And you can determine how that simulation is going to be output on the screen. So basically, how are they rendered? As I mentioned, there is more depth to it. For example, you can actually plug events within spawners that you can actually trigger via the inspector or via script um, to start and stop the spawning of particles. You can do spawner chaining, where you can have one spawner plugged into another spawner. So its spawning can cause another system to start or stop spawning. We have um, custom um, spawner behaviors. You can write in C-sharp, 
any kind of custom way you want it to spawn. Maybe it's not in bursts or um, you know, over time, maybe it's over distance, maybe it's something else. We even have GPU events, and again, for those familiar with uh, the particle system in Unity, they're a bit similar to sub-emitters, except that they go a little bit further than that. It allows you to inherit any particle data from one system and pass it on to, the, to another system. The demo that we're gonna show later is gonna demonstrate all of these in a little bit more detail. And same with the outputs. Yes, you can have one output for your system, but we're not limiting you to this. You can have multiple outputs, so you can calculate the same simulation and then decide that, well, I wanna have some points, some quads, some meshes, some lines. You can do some last minute adjustments to those as well. Offset them, flip them, rotate them, change the color. So there's a lot of depth to explore, but we've designed the visual effects graph in such a way that it's quite accessible for beginners without having to require any prior knowledge. Now, Julian is gonna give us a proper technical overview of what's happening under the hood. Yeah. So, <clears throat> we're gonna see how we, do I have sound? Yeah. Hmm? We're gonna see how we transform, uh, so your visual graph from the highly optimized data in real time. Just, when you create an effect, you will work with the graph, so you have your context, your block, your node, and all this is actually a scriptable object, and it defines a hierarchy. All those objects are stored within the... Okay. <laughs> Check. Is it working? No? Okay. Just <laughs> so all the, those objects are stored within uh, the, the visual effect asset as sub-assets. So from this high-level graph representation, we generate a lower-level representation. We call the expression graph which is um, like an abstract syntax tree for those who are familiar with this term. So this expression graph goes into the VFX compiler, which will generate all the runtime data. So we, have, we generate quite a bunch of data. So first we generate shaders. So we generate compute shaders for all the simulation passes and vertex and pixel shader pairs for the rendering. We're also able to evaluate expression on CPU, even if we are GPU particles only. For instance, for all the expression that are not changing per particle, but are per system, they can be evaluated only once per frame on CPU instead of being evaluated once per particle on GPU. So we issue byte code for that that will be fed into a CPU interpreter. Then we generate the data layout of the particles. As we know all the context, we know which attribute you are using in your system, which attribute you are writing, reading. We can generate a highly optimized data layout in the form of a structure on a, of arrays. So only necessary attributes are stored. So for instance, if in your system you don't use, you don't write the velocity at all, it won't be stored, it won't exist in the system. We also generate a property sheet that this allows to uh, access exposed parameters, by name, via script, or in timeline, and also to override them per component. And finally, a list of VFX systems that bind everything together and issue commands to our VFX manager. So, a little use case here. So this is the graph of the, the pink logo with millions of particles you've seen at the very beginning of this presentation. Um, so basically, we have a sphere and we are moving this sphere using sine functions. Then we spawn particles on this sphere, and then the particles are attracted by a vector field. So a vector field is a 3D texture that stores direction. So the vector field has the shape of the Unity logo, and on top of that, we had another vector field, um, which is a high-frequency noise, and we're rotating this vector field so that the particles on the logo have cool motion. So from this graph, what will generate shader code and what will generate CPU byte code? So here, we fetch the particle position and the particle velocity. We fetch the position uh, to blend the color based on the distance of the sphere. And we fetch the velocity to stretch the particle size based on its speed. So this is on GPU because we are using particle data so all the operation that follows will generate shader code. All the rest can be evaluated only once per frame on CPU. 
Then we have the concept of do we know uh, a, a given uh, computation at compile time or at runtime? So here we fetch the particle system time. So we use it uh, to rotate the sphere, to, to move it. We use it to, uh, to rotate the vector field, the noise vector field, and also to uh, change the initial particle color. So the time is not known at compile time. And we also have an expose parameters, which is the radius of the sphere. So it's not known at compile time because it can be overridden, it can be set via script, and etc. So all operations that follows are mutable and not known at compile time. So here, we, the dark blue can be optimized as constant because they are known at compile time, so we can do constant folding on them. And here, in this example, there's not that much, but it can remove lots of branch, big branches of the graph at one time. So from that, we have two versions of compile data. One at edit time, so when you open your effect in, uh, in the graph window, uh, we don't want to, uh, to recompile uh, every time the effect. So you can edit all the values without recompiling the effect uh, directly. Plus, we add debug and profiling da data to help you optimize your effect. Whereas at runtime, we will use the optimized constant folding reduced graph so that everything is highly optimized. A word on the production pipeline. So a production pipeline is very important for VFX and tech artists because they always often use quite a lot of tools to generate the da their data. So we need a smooth, a smooth workflow between those tools. Moreover, we'd like to bring to Unity as many things as we can, so you don't have to, to, to use external tools to do simple things. So, some time ago we initiated the VFX Toolbox, which is a project that is meant to be a suite of tools to generate data that are then usable within the visual effect graph, or shader graph, or the current particle system, or anywhere in Unity, actually. So at the moment, it's a single tool toolbox. So there's only the image sequencer. So the image sequencer allows you to assemble flipbooks to be used uh, to render your particles. Now we add to that a point cache bake tool. So a point cache is basically a set of points that, that hold attributes. So it can be position, velocity, normal, UVs, color, or any custom attributes. So you can then use those data to drive your particle simulation in real time. So we provide a tool to create point caches from meshes and from textures. And we also have a Houdini exporter that can export vector fields and point caches directly usable in Unity. So from this foundation, we want to, to build upon that and improve the toolbox. We want to add tools, to add exporters, to add lots of stuff. So first of all, the VFX toolbox will be a Unity package alongside the visual effect graph package because we didn't want to merge the toolbox within the, the VFX package because we want the toolbox to remain independent so that you can use the, the generated data anywhere in Unity. We want to add more DCC tool integration, like exporters for Maya or Blender, for instance. We also like to, um, we want to improve the, the image sequencer by being able to generate motion vectors map, so from optical flow. So basically motion vectors allows uh, smoother interpolation between frames. So if you look at the uh, explosion animation here, so on, the right, on your right hand side, you have the, 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 the interpolation with the motion vector. So you see it's really smooth compared to, to the classical linear interpolation in the middle. And on the left hand side, it's all the frames without any interpolation. So you see how it improves the quality of the, of the flipbook animation. And finally, we want to add quite a lot of tools to generate various types of data. 
We want tools to generate vector fields, sign distance fields from mesh. We also put a type of flow map painter. So all this will uh, come eventually to the VFX toolbox. So now it's time for a live demo by Vlad, uh, directly in editor. Thank you. I think my favorite thing about this presentation is everybody who walked in late is wondering why I was standing so uncomfortably close to Julian. Right. So we put together a small effect to um, sort of show on stage and then deconstruct, um, just to kind of go over the things that are involved in it. Um, one thing to mention, you know how every live demo that you see always runs on a computer you can never afford? Um, I have a very small laptop here, so I'm just going to show you that this is really real time and it doesn't really require any two kind of fancy equipment. So uh, we have a genie lamp here because the uh, icon, the gizmo for the visual effects graph is a little magic lamp. And when we click on it, we can let the genie out of the magic lamp. So we're going to basically deconstruct this effect in a second and talk about you know, how it's made. And it's actually like really, really simple. There's only a few different components and we're just kind of repeating the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to exit out of here and switch back to a scene that we have a bit more of a deconstructed view of what's happening. And then I'm going to walk you through the individual steps. I also have, like in the previous presentation, little presets here. And just switching to the view that I need. Great. So I've disabled most of the things. We just have the smoke right here. Uh, one thing to mention is the smoke is lit. So we're using HDRP, and uh, these are lit particles. You know, they react real time to the light here. Um, there's a few different ways that uh, you can actually make things be affected with um, the scene. You know, I could have, for example, structured this with just some kind of velocity and you know, just forces to make it uh, curve around. But what I wanted to do is have a way to control it with the uh, scene objects. So alongside the visual effect graph, we're actually going to ship um, a bunch of binder scripts. So if you don't necessarily want to write your own scripts, you know, they're pretty much you do add component and we have these different binders. What I'm doing here basically is I have within Blackboard, which is the place you can put different attributes that you can expose then, I have uh, three different um, vector threes that are exposed, position one, two, and three. And you can see them over here within the component of the visual effects graph. So this is how the component looks. We have the actual asset, and the asset is being created by just right-clicking in your project folder, going create, visual effects, and visual effects graph. And this will create basically a file, kind of like this, and then you can either drag onto your hierarchy or in the scene to create an instance of it um, for your level. So anyway, we have right now the uh, genie smoke open, and what I'm doing here is I'm actually connecting it with the three scene objects. So I have these three game objects here. I'm just going to enable their renderer so we can visualize these. So these three spheres. And what I'm doing is I'm plugging their position. Basically, the binder script that we just discussed over here is uh, updating the position of these exposed uh, uh, parameters. And I'm using them in a Bezier curve node. So what's happening is at level 0 here, it's the position of the lamp. Then we have level 1, 2, and three. And this is real time. So I think if I can grab one of them, for example, you know, I can move it and you can see how the graph will just update. And you can see also that the particles are lit. And that changes here. So I'm going to make them invisible again. So what's happening basically, as we discussed in the beginning, we have a spawner contextual node. And this is actually saying how many particles are being spawned. <clears throat> Excuse me. As Julian mentioned, we have two types of um, code. We have the one that's optimized for runtime, and we have the one in the editor. The editor code basically means that I can change, after, uh, I can change parameters without having to recompile the shader. So this is really powerful because it allows you to preview things real, real fast and to really get the results that you want. We want to make sure that artists uh, have a very fast, streamlined workflow. So spawn sets the number of particles. In initialize, I'm setting some basic attributes, you know, their lifetime, their size, a bit of randomness in their alpha. And then in update, I have a flipbook player that is basically just cycling through the different smoke uh, flipbooks to animate the texture. And then I'm setting the position, as I mentioned, uh, between these four points over the lifetime of the particle. So at particle lifetime zero, they're at the beginning here. 
and at particle lifetime one, which means before the particles expire, they're at the end of the curve. I'm adding a little random number here so they don't all die in the exact same spot. So for example, if I increase this, you see how it kind of changes the um, shape and outlook of uh, the smoke because some of the particles will not traverse to the end. And that's really it. That's how we're doing the smoke. So then next, I have the actual magic effect, you know, these sparkly bits. I'm just going to enable this. And it is using the exact same logic as the smoke. So I'm not really adding anything too crazy different here. You know, I'm um, adding a little bit of randomness, you know, just long curves, just to really get a little bit more of uh, movement within these. But they're using pretty much the exact same logic we discussed before, the same structure. We have spawning, we have initializing, we're updating things, and then we're outputting them. One thing that's a little bit different here, though, is we have this trigger uh, block, in this case, trigger event on die. And morbid though, as it might sound, basically every time a particle dies, it triggers a GPU event, which in itself acts as a spawner for another system. So in other words, every time a particle from the initial magic smoke dies, a new particle is spawned, and that actually becomes in the shape of the genie. And this system is literally just doing that. It's uh, spawning particles at the same location when the previous particle died, and then I'm conforming them to this sign distance field that uh, Julian mentioned, which is really just a 3D texture. So I baked one out uh, of the genie, but we can just literally change this very quickly here to the Unity logo. I can just rotate it a little bit, and that's it. You know, you can literally have a very, very fast workflow in this. And there's nothing magical to it. I don't have to control really how the particles go after this and how they flow. You can update these assets. It's very, very extendable. So I'm going to undo this. Lovely though the Unity logo is. And then the last thing I'll show here from the effects is I have spawner chaining, which we discussed before, which is one system basically allowing to trigger another system. Now, the reason for that is if I recompile this, all the effects start, but you see it takes a little while before we form the genie. So it'd be really creepy if we just have some floating eyes before the genie's there. So what happens now is I have here a spawner that is spawning literally one particle as a single burst, but it's delayed by five seconds. So from compiling time, basically this is waiting five seconds, and then it says, oh, I'm triggering some kind of data. And then it goes down here, and this basically makes this particle system start. Beyond that, one last thing on this side is, I discussed before that you can have one whole simulation, so I'm sharing the same spawner, same initialize, same update, but what I'm doing at the end is I'm actually dragging out two different outputs for the left eye and the right eye. And excuse me the pun, but I've just eyeballed the position, but that's the whole idea, right? That you can actually offset things within the same system. It's using the same data, and then at the very end, I'm saying, well, oh, add a little bit of position to it. And that's really it, the gist of it. Now, the only thing that I haven't mentioned yet is we made it interact with the environment, right? We clicked on the lamp and the particle spawned. So I've done this here so I don't have to redo it on stage completely, but um, I've created two different uh, events. One is called start, one is called stop. You can name it anything you want. Um, this is basically something you can then call via uh, C Sharp, or we even have this ability to select a visual effects graph that's in the scene, attach it, and then you get additional controls here. So that allows you to you know, stop, play, uh, maybe change the play rate, etc. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reconnect these nodes as they originally were. So move this down here disconnect the old note, and just so it doesn't recompile all the time, even though Julian mentioned that, you know, this is a very powerful thing <clears throat> when you don't have to wait um, and click a recompile all the time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we can also disable that. So if I turn off auto compile, I can make all the changes I need and then really just plug it in once I'm all done with them. So that saves me some time. So I'm plugging in these events with the um, spawning of the smoke. Uh, then I'm going to plug them with the spawning of the uh, magic itself. So I'm moving it down here, removing this. And last but not least, I'm going to plug in the eyes to the same effect. So there it is. Disconnecting the old node and connecting the new one. So then I'm going to just turn auto compile back on. I could have just clicked compile as well. And what this does now is that we have these events here. It's not auto starting by itself because it has an event plugged in. So it will wait for that event. I can click then start. It's going to spawn system. Uh, and I can click stop at any point. And it's basically going to just stop spawning new particles. Um, 
A few other things to mention, which uh, we'll cover a little bit more. We have another session tomorrow uh, in um, one of these pop-up talks that's going to be more in the editor and go more step-by-step -step on some of the simpler things. But um, we have a lot of different nodes that we've added. Um, you can really just browse through them and um, combine them in any kind of different way. Uh, we have also basic systems that we added that you don't necessarily even have to start from scratch every time. So if you find yourself in your studio reusing sort of the same base effect and then you keep extending it, you can drop these in a special folder where then you can literally just create a new system from one click. And then if you need to, you can modify it a little bit further. Okay. And that's basically it for the demo part. We're going to go back now to uh, PowerPoint. And I'm going to pass it on to Julian, along with my microphone. No, I think your mind is working now. Oh, happy days. <laughs> Um, so keep in mind the VFX graph is at a very early stage at the moment. So it's experimental, it's not production ready yet, and uh, we count on you to provide us with feedback to help us improve the tool and implement the features you need. So the visual effect graph will be available as an experimental package in Packet Manager for 18.3. So during November. Still, we have uh, some features that are missing and that we'd like to add uh, as soon as possible. First one is shader graph integration. So we really want a tight integration between shader graph and the visual effect graph so that you can use particular attributes directly within shader graph to, uh, to drive your vertex and pixel computations. We also have to implement subgraphs so that you can create behaviors into subgraphs, share them with others, and reuse them. We definitely want CPU particles. So this will be built on top of ECS, HPC Sharp, Job System, all the effort that was put recently into Unity to have fast uh, processing on CPU and fast parallelism. And finally, we want to add other container than particles. We want to add trays, ribbons, volumes, or procedural meshes. So uh, this concludes this presentation. So thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have any questions, we're happy to, to try to answer them. There's a couple of mics in the back. If you have questions, we'll ask you to use those um, because the session is being recorded. Um, a little bit of also in um, housekeeping. Uh, later today on the keynote, we'll have an unveil of an actual visual effects demo that we have worked on. So uh, check that out, definitely. Um, and yeah, we definitely look forward to seeing what you guys are going to make with this. So thank you very much. Thank you. So how much of the graph is going to be editable with editor tools, and how much of it is going to be templatable for people to like make one graph and then copy it six times and make small adjustments? So you mean all the, all the graph is a scriptable object in C-sharp, so you can add yours. We have an API for that. And, uh... Yeah, so basically you can extend or, um, I mean, the files are there, right? It's a package, it's in C-sharp, so it can just duplicate something. If, for example, our, um, I don't know, Bezier curve node doesn't suit you, yeah, open the file and edit it. Sweet. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, yes. So you talked about custom events in uh, the graph. I was wondering how those are invoked in code, and also can you retrieve those via code? So we have an API uh, in the, the component send effect. So you send your effect, and that's it. <laughs> and uh, you can also, uh, what wasn't mentioned, you can bound, um, you can add attributes to the effect that will be reused by the simulation. So you can read then the attributes you send to the effect. For instance, you, you can send an effect with a red color or an effect with a blue color, and then reuse them in a, in a, in a, in a simulation of the particle system. So to clarify, actually, um, I wanted to know if the system is similar to like the audio mixer where you send a string with a value to invoke the event, or if it's just a, similar to a function call that's exposed in code. Is there a way to do that dynamically, or do you have to know that ahead of time? You send a string, yeah. It's a, okay. it's a name. Uh, the events are named. Right. And can you retrieve those event names at runtime? Are they exposed anywhere? 
Uh, I don't think we have an API at the moment to uh, fetch to get all the names uh, of the events, but I mean we can add it. Uh, okay. No yeah, just because that's one of the big problems with working like the audio okay. mixer is you have so to know the exact string, and it's a huge pain to dig it out. So. Okay, so it's good to know that. Uh, it's Thanks. Be useful. Thank you. Hi. Yep. I, I have two questions. So the first one, the spheres that drive the smoke, mm -hmm. um, are those? Can you animate those? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I didn't want to go in here into play mode because, as I mentioned, I have a very small laptop that's not the most powerful. But in the original uh, effect that I played, um, yeah, they actually have a bit of brownian noise and they're just moving around a little bit. So yeah, you can. It literally is just grabbing and um, doing set vector on the shader with that position. So as long as that changes, it will actually update the values. So absolutely. Cool. Yeah, and then can. the second one is um, with the genie with the particles dying on top of it on the static image. Can you actually use a um, a sequential image? Does it have to be? Can it can it be anything or? Yeah, we don't have that at the moment, but uh, it's doable actually. It will require us to have like a a kind of uh, sine distance field flipbook, so kind of uh, a flipbook in a texture three D. Cool. So it's doable, but we want to add that uh, like directly in the in the core technology, so you don't have to do it by hand if you want to do it. Right. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yep. So I might have missed this, but th this is really cool, by the way, and, and all okay. that. But uh, like with um, Unity's vanilla particle system, mm -hmm. I don't really. I, I'm curious to see what the relationship of using the vanilla of uh, van vanilla particle system in Unity with this uh, tool. Is there going to be any sort of relationship? Is this I mean, I don't think that this is meant to be like a replacement for it, but I mean, that's actually what I thought it was at first because of just like how, how much uh, more you can do with it uh, and stuff in, certain, in terms of workflow and everything, but what, what is your goals behind that? So as Julian mentioned, uh, when we compared CPU versus GPU particles, there's definitely use cases for either. And right now, because the visual effect graph is GPU only, by all means, it's not gonna replace Shuriken. Later down the road, you know, once we implement the CPU part, then that's maybe another conversation we can have, but Shuriken is gonna be relevant for many, many years. That oh. being said, <laughs> yeah, but that being said also, um, you know, it really depends what kind of effect you're looking at. You know, if you need something to collide with the world as it is, you know, and you don't need a lot of particles, you know, then yeah, you can definitely use uh, the um, particle system within Unity. Um, but um, I, I guess it's really like just the tool for the right job, you know, based on what you really need for that. Yeah, but yeah, just to add to that, uh, as soon as we have uh, CPU particles and feature parity, I mean, you can do everything that you can do sure you can within uh, the visual effect graph, basically. And uh, the, the advantage is that you can create your own custom behaviors very easily. You don't have to rely on us to add some new modules to sure you can to add some yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah thank you. A lot more flexible. You're welcome. Yep. Yes. So with the recent push for the timeline functionality and the playable director, mm -hmm. do you guys intend to also add in controllers for those so that you could play everything back and Timeline. Forth? Yeah, we have a timeline integration uh, at the moment. It's not finished yet. We still have some stuff to add, so we're going to work on it uh, to have a, a really tight integration of, of timeline. OK, cool. Thank you. So the idea is for um, the visual effects graph to really to be interactable by all other parts of uh, Unity. You know, so it's not a standalone thing. It's very much integrated. Yep. Yes. I had a question about animation. So the 3D texture you're using to display the genie, is it possible to like run an animation and create that 3D texture dynamically off of like a, an animation or something? Um, so uh, right now we have these exporters. So I've exported this from Houdini. Um, maybe once we add actually the ability to support emission from like a um, scan mesh renderer, for example, then you wouldn't really even want to do you know flipping to a 3D texture as a flipbook because that you know okay. is kind of prohibitive. Yeah, it's large. Um, but I guess there's different ways you can achieve that, right? So right now you can animate things in terms of like how strong they're gonna be attracted, you know, like what's the uh, stick force to it, uh, what distance that is stick from, that kind of stuff. But I can't, for example, make the genie move his hands right now, his or her hands. I see. Yep. Hi, uh, I wanted to know, if you want to create a new node, do you only need, do you only need a C sharp or can you use a shader code? Uh, for what, sir, can you repeat that? If you want to create new, new nodes, New notes, yep. Yeah. Uh, so it depends. So if you're just talking notes, it's C sharp. 
right? Now, for outputs, we're still working on that uh, solution. As Julian mentioned, shader graph integration is sort of on the top of our list because making custom outputs is not something that is really, I think we can do it internally, but it's not something that's very streamlined or user friendly. Ideally, we have a great tool with that in shader graph and we'd like for people to be able to use that. But yeah, for nodes, blocks, it's basically C sharp. Okay. Yeah, it's C sharp and we have our own uh, expression system because we can generate either CPU or GPU code. Okay. But for blocks, for blocks, it's uh, so GPU only because they, they will be in the compute shaders. So at the moment, it's uh, you author them in C sharp with a string of uh, HLSS snippets, just like shader graph, basically. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yep. So this kind of ties into what you were talking about just now. I think could you um, clarify the relationship between nodes and contexts and blocks a little bit? Uh, yes, and, and by the way, we'll be wrapping up in a little bit so we can continue it outside. There's gonna be a little area, just to kind of let you guys know. Um, but um, the contextual nodes are really just sort of these overarching uh, stages of the system. Are we spawning, are we initializing, are we updating, are we outputting? Blocks live within these contextual nodes, and as an example, in initialize, you can have a set position block. And then later in update, I can have an at position block. So blocks are really the ways that you um, sort of uh, edit and um, control the attributes uh, that are per particle. And then into those, you plug the nodes. And the nodes are everything that's outside of the actual big graph. Yeah, blocks are basically uh, just factorization of nodes. So you can have just like modules, just like, like Shuriken, for instance. But we have, um, we have different uh, granularity for blocks, so you have uh, like, for instance, set position, a block that set the position, and you can plug uh, all the graph you want. But we also have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I don't know if we want to apply like a vector field that will update the position and stuff like that. It will be dire directly within the node, the, the block, sorry. But you can still use the block set position and do it outside using nodes. Okay. Okay. Is there going to be any provision for non-editable or encrypted assets? that are generated from the tool set. It's been a big problem for other DCC tools that have marketplaces. Uh, we haven't thought about that, but it's a, it's a good question. Because so. the asset store could literally become just littered with people selling other people's work a lot. Yeah. Very quickly. So it's, uh, yeah. We need to think about that, yeah. Sure. Thanks. Yep, and last question, maybe? OK. Um, what kind of performance analysis tools do we have for this? Can we? find out the time for a node? Can, does it integrate with the profiler? No, not at the, not at the node granularity at the moment. We, uh, we, you can, uh, we have like profiler markers, so you can see uh, how long an update, uh, an update uh, lasts uh, in, the, in the Unity profiler, or what's the, the, the time for the rendering, stuff like that. But we want to add new, new tools on an internal profiler, especially for the effect to help you profile your effect. But this will come a bit later. Thank you. Thank you. If you guys have any other questions, we're going to be out there for a few minutes, and then we're going to be downstairs into the Meet the Devs booth. So thank you very much. Thank you.